Good evening, everyone. My name is Aubrey Lyons. I'm the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council. I've been involved in many different capacities over the last 13 years, and I'm happy to be here tonight as our director. The World Affairs Council, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. We were founded in 2000 by former ambassador and Great Falls native, Ambassador Mark Johnson, who is on a Mediterranean cruise at the moment. Otherwise, he would be here. He started the council, we're part of a national network. There's over 90 councils in 45 states and we are the Montana Council, so we have quite a big space to fill and a small staff to do that. His vision was to bring the world to Montana and Montana to the world and to reach this vision. We host programs such as this evening's Distinguished Speakers Program with Imam Faisal, business luncheon roundtables, and a variety of global education initiatives. Our largest being Academic World Quest, which is a full day high school international education event. And I'm proud to report that for the fifth year in a row, Montana Council is the third largest in the nation, just behind Dallas and Hawaii. <laughs> Additionally, we hold council in the classroom programs. So tomorrow, the Imam will speak to 250 Missoula High School students and today he had the opportunity to get grilled by questions from six classrooms around the state everywhere from Darby to Livingston and Lodge Grass and everywhere in between. These programs are only made possible by the support of our members. We are a membership organization and receive a few small grants and individual donations and members and so we appreciate your support and invite you to become a member if you appreciate um, programs like this this evening. We have brochures on every table, and anyone dressed in all black would be more than happy to answer any questions as well as opportunities to join online. A few housekeeping notes. You may have noticed that there are little cards on your chairs. As um, we are a nonprofit, we attempt to use 10 sides to every piece of paper. So this piece is multi-purpose. On the front side, we would like your feedback on the best way that we can reach you about our upcoming programs. And so if you would be so kind as to fill that out and let us know how you heard about tonight's event. And if you would like to include your name and email, we would be happy to share with you upcoming programs and events and put you on our, on our email blast. And we don't share it and we don't have a lot of time, so we don't flood your inbox. On the back side, we'd encourage you to write questions. We know many of you have um, in anticipation of our guests this evening have some very thoughtful and respectful questions that you would like to ask and so we would ask you to write those on the back. The pen is yours to keep as a souvenir and if you'd like to pass them to the edges of the aisles we will have our interns um, pick those up and bring those to the stage to be selected. Also at the end of the night if you do not have a question if you wouldn't mind we'll be collecting those little cards just as you exit. We have a full lineup of fall and winter council programs which we would love to have you attend. Our next distinguished speaker program is December 7th on U.S.-Cuban relations with Ambassador Vicki Huddleston. And we also have our, mark your calendars, fourth annual Global Gauntlet Team Trivia Competition. And this is our annual fundraiser for our education programs modeled after our Academic World Quest High School competition. And you'd be surprised at the level um, we sometimes have high school tables that can that can rally their, their teams against groups of adults. So it's a really fun evening and I'd encourage you all to attend. Just a few quick thank yous, um, especially to Callie and her staff at the Doubletree who always such a, does such a wonderful job in putting these together. Cassie Strauss, our International Programs Director, an extraordinary group of UM interns that we have this year as well as our all-volunteer board of directors and our volunteers which do all of the work behind the scenes to make this happen. And especially a warm welcome and thank you to Imam Faisal.
for traveling all the way to Montana and bringing some sunshine after a few days of rain. We promised him a mountain view and took a drive up Grant Creek this evening, so he did have a chance to enjoy, enjoy some scenery. Last but not least, Bob Seiden-Schwartz, who was our moderator this evening and board president and the World Affairs Council is his other full-time job, and we so appreciate his time and energy put into this program. So thank you all for coming, and we hope you enjoy the evening. And please join me in welcoming Imam Faisal and thanking Bob Seiden. going to give a little brief bio because there's so much to discuss, so much information that uh, I'm looking forward to sharing tonight. Iman Faisal Abdul Rauf is chairman of the Cordoba Initiative, a multi-faith international organization dedicated to improving Muslim relations with the West. He served as Iman of Mas... Please help me with this. Sorry. The Farrah Fawcett Mosque. I bet you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> in New York City from 1983 to 2009. His three books on Islam and its place in contemporary Western society include Moving the Mountain, named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World in 2011. Iman Faisal sits on the Board of Trustees of the Islamic Center of New York, advises the Interfaith Center of New York, and belongs to the World Economic Forum Council of 100 Leaders, Islamic West Dialogue. A leading voice of moderation, Iman Faisal has participated regularly in the, on, in the Council on Foreign Relations and appeared at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Relations, excuse me, major media have quoted him extensively, BBC, CNN, Frontline, Fox News, New York Times, Washington Post, and many, many more. If you wish to, you can see his most recent op-ed on the Huntington Post. So a few words before I introduce our very special guest. One, I am thrilled to see all of you here tonight. This is truly a reflection of Missoula, and the community that we are comes out, whatever the issues may be, to voice their thoughts and opinions. And as always, we welcome our guests to our house. You are a very special guest, and we will treat you with the respect that we would anybody that would come to break bread with us. I've had the privilege of being able to spend a couple of days, plus the radio program that we've done several times at Montana World Affairs Council on the radio. Some of you may have heard this wonderfully gravelly voice. It will never get a media job on radio. And it's even worse given the cold that I have right now, so my apologies. But we've been able to establish a connection, a personal connection and being able to share different views, different thoughts. Some we agree, some we disagree. But the purpose of coming here tonight is to be able to share our different viewpoints in an open environment. And for that, I want to say thank you to every single one of you who traveled and came tonight to join us. So please, a round of applause for yourselves for coming here tonight. We've got a lot to get to, a lot of questions, lots of discussion. So it's my privilege to introduce Iman Faisal Abdul Rauf. Please, a warm Missoula welcome. That kiss is not a mafia kiss. <laughs> thank you very much, Bob, for your very, very warm welcome, and thank you very much for this wonderful and warm audience, many of, some of whom I've gotten to know. And I'm, uh, I'm happy that you were, just didn't get it, enough of me as, uh, at lunch, and I see Laurie here. Uh, you know, so I'm glad to, to see uh, new friends, uh, as well as uh, many of your faces. Um, thank you for, to Aubrey, for, to the all the staff of the World Affairs Council for having invited me to this lovely, lovely state, which for many, many years I've been told, you've got to see Montana. It's, it's the, the most beautiful country, the most beautiful you know, land in, in, in state in, in the United States. And uh, um, I'm certainly delighted to have come and gotten a glimpse of the beauty, not only of the land, but more importantly of the people. Uh, you're a beautiful people. Um, not only physically attractive, <laughs> but also genuine. I was struggling with the word for the last day, the last day or so, and how would I would define my experience of Montana. And I, and I was struck by this, even before I came, 
There was a genuineness that came through when Bob was interviewing me that I don't see with Fox News interviewers, you know. Uh, a genuineness and, and a genuine desire to, to understand, um, uh, to understand not only out of a sense of intellectual curiosity, but to, um, to know each other. You know, th th there's a verse in the Quran where, where God says, I created mankind from one male and one female. But I created you, God addresses humankind, from one male and one female. And I've made you into tribes and nations so that, so that you would get to know one another. And, and, and this, this quality of knowing, this kind of knowing, which is, uh, uh, you know, the way scripture talks about knowing, uh, is something that uh, is, is defines the relationship uh, of our interaction today. Um, of course, it's a biblical sense of knowing, you know, when she says, and she knew him, you know, <laughs> or he knew her, you know. <laughs> oh, rats. <laughs> Um, you know, but it, 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 it serves to show that, the, that scriptural knowing is more than just a kind of a mere intellectual uh, familiarity with something. Uh, it, I remember many years ago, uh, I had this a lady friend, and uh, she was saying something, and you know, like we guys tend to do, I was disputing what she was saying, and she said to me, Faisal, you are listening to me with your head. You have to hear me with your heart. And all of a sudden, I felt my jaw drop down and says, oh, how come I never thought of that before? And, and that defined for me one of the things that we men need to do very often is not, only, is not only to listen with our heads, but to listen with our hearts. And that's, that describes the kind of sentiment I felt in the last day and with my experience with Bob when he was, um, you know, interviewing on the radio show. I felt a, a distinctive difference, and that's what I think is unique about Montana, about Montanans, about my interaction with the, all the people here in the last couple of days. Well, no, it's not couple, it's been one day. Uh, and I'm very grateful, grateful for that. Um, where do I begin? Um, well, this is meant to be some introductory remarks, is the real, the, the real, um, meat and potatoes of this discussion tonight will be what I call a Larry King show with, uh, with, uh, with Larry King here uh, or going to interview me and, and taking, taking uh, questions from various members of the audience uh, so that it would become as much as possible a, uh, a real a discourse and a dialogue between us uh, rather than a, 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 a unidirectional uh, discussion from me to you. Um, but let me just tell you the, the briefly about myself, my story. I was born in Kuwait um, of Egyptian parents. And when I was 18 months, my father was transferred. My father was a graduate of Al-Azhar University, which was at that time the most powerful and influential uh, seminary in the, in the Sunni Muslim world. It still is important today, but it has been uh, pretty much um, less influential than it was at that time, which was 1947 when my father was sent to Kuwait. At, at the age of 18 months, my father went to England to study at the University of Cambridge, and I grew up in Cambridge, and I began my education in kindergarten in Cambridge, so I sometimes pride myself on having started with the Cambridge education. Uh, at the age of six, my, uh, we returned to Egypt when I was six years old, and then my father, after a few months, was sent to a country called the Federation of Malaya, which was then a British uh, colony. It gained its independence two years later in 1957. Uh, I lived there from 1955 till the end of 64 for almost 10 years. And I came of age and began to think of myself uh, and ask myself the existential questions of who am I, what am I, am I Egyptian, am I, am I Malay, am I English? Because each of these aspects were a major part of, of myself, my culture, my way of thinking, my language, that I could not, and I loved each part of it. You know, you grew up in England and having fish and chips and malt vinegar, 
um, and, and growing up singing nursery rhymes. And there were many things about English culture which I loved. Uh, and there were things about Arabic culture that I loved, and things about Malay culture that I loved. And there are things that I didn't dislike them. I, mean, I was sufficiently smart to critique my own people in many ways. Uh, but I couldn't just universally you know, adopt an attitude, oh, England is the, is the, uh, the, the evil colonializers and you know, that kind of, I didn't adopt that attitude. Um, so I, I um, began to have a experience what we would call an identity crisis and wondering who I was and what I was and, and which part of me was the real I and what was, and I, and I discovered that every few years I would look different. You know, I look at these albums that my mom had ever since I was a baby through different, I went through my cute period and what I call my ugly period uh, and so forth. Um, but not only, not only did, my, did I physically change, I, I discovered in, at, the, at the age of 14, and as I was growing up, it's 17, 18, 19, I, I discovered that even my ambitions changed. When I was a little kid in England, I wanted to be an engine driver like almost every English kid. By the time I was seven, eight, I think I wanted to be a film star, uh, then a, um, um, a musician, a music director. And be between the ages of four and 14, I must have gone through different ambitions. Uh, and most painfully of all, um, different crushes. And when I was six, I had a crush over my teacher. And when she got married, I felt really jilted. <laughs> it's my first experience at being, being, being crushed. I thought she was, she was affectionate to me, you know. And every two years, I'd say, oh my God, if this girl doesn't, if I don't win this girl's heart, I would die. And two years later, I'd say, what was I thinking of, you know? And I'd have another person I'd have a crush over. That wasn't so serious until actually we had serious relationships. Um, and I'm sure many of you have experienced what I call the immortality of our loves. And you, you know, you get married to somebody, you, you, you swear that you'll love this person till death do you part. And within the proverbial seven years or less, uh, you wake up one morning, and through no fault of the other person, you felt like somebody just took a vac an emotional vacuum cleaner and just, you know, vacuumed the, the feelings out of your heart. And you wake up one morning, literally overnight, having no feeling for this person. I'm sure there are people here who have... <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not talking something that you're not familiar with, right? <laughs> But the, the, the question then is that if, if everything about me changed, if my physical appearance changed, my, my ambitions changed, my ideas changed, my priorities changed, my, my loves changed, in spite of myself, why do I have this conviction that I'm the same person? Why do I still say that this Faisal and the Faisal who was born my birth, my 67th birthday will be on Friday, the day after tomorrow, by the way. Hint, hint. <laughs> I, wanted a, I wanted one of those fancy steak dinners, which, which I've only had once in my, in my 50 years of life in, in America. Um, and so Bob said he'll, he'll try and get me that. Um, what happened here? So... Uh, the question is, why am I convinced that I'm still the same person? And that was the question I asked myself when I was, um, when I was growing up. I asked myself this question before I was 17 years of age. Why am I still convinced that I'm the same I? And um, coupled, parallel to that, was certain experiences that, that propelled me along what I call the spiritual path. One was when I was brought up as a child and my father, who was pressured by his father to memorize the Qur'an, which he did at the age of eight, and my father felt that, it was, that, that was very abusive of my grandfather to treat him that way, so he left us completely free. But by the age of seven, eight, nine, I said, Dad, you know, isn't it embarrassing? Or, you know, I was the one telling my dad, you're a religious scholar and your son doesn't know how to pray. 
It's my high time we teach me how to pray. I said, okay, fine, so we'll teach you how to pray. So I learned how to pray. There's a formula in our prayers, where, when the seated position, where I say, I bear witness that there is no God but God. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. And I witness that there is, that Muhammad is the messenger of God. And as I was praying, and after I learned how to pray, and I was praying, every time I would say this, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, I'd hear a voice in my saying, Faisal, you're a bloody hypocrite. You're saying this major statement that you have witnessed that there is no God but God. You haven't even witnessed God. What are you talking about? That, that, that emotion was welling up in my heart. So I, I even challenged my, I probed my dad one day, you know, lunch was the, what we called lunch dinner, the middle of the, you know, and we called the evening was supper. I, that part of my, our British background, I think. Um, it was also the fact that for most cultures, the main meal was the, the middle of the day, the midday meal, and the, the evening meal was not the big meal like we have here in America. So I'd say, Dad, isn't the word, uh, ash, doesn't ashhadu mean to see, to witness? I said, yes, my soul. Well, doesn't ashhadu an la ilaha illallah then mean that I've seen that there's no God but God? I said, yes, but I said, Dad, I haven't seen God yet. So I'm praying and I can't, I don't feel that my prayer is really authentic and meaningful. I don't know, I discovered friends of mine who are Jews and Christians have their similar stories of their experiences in their own faith traditions. But that was what propelled me onto the, what, was, what people call in, in our faith tradition, the Sufi path. The, 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 now, how do you really see God? Those of you who are of, of my generation remember the George Harrison song, I really want to see you, Lord. I really want to see you, Lord. I mean, that, that, that song to me captured the, the, the desire of every human being, which says, if there is a God, how can I know that God is, ju is true, that God has a message for me, that God cares for me, speaks to me? How do, I, how, do I, how do I perceive the reality of God? How do I experience the reality of God? So that was my quest. I write about it in my book, Moving the Mountain. And of course, as I believe happens to everybody, including the major French atheist whose name I'm blanking on right now, Jacques something or other, uh, who talks about what I believe to be his own personal experience. Um, it happened to me serendipitously. One day I was coming back from school on the bus and I had this moment which I can only describe as um, the boundaries of my ego dissolving for a minute. I see some groans of recognition there. And, 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 and at that, for that minute, I felt a oneness, an experiential oneness with all of reality. And I felt in the presence of and the absolute power, absolute being, absolute consciousness, absolute love and compassion. And to me, that was, for me, my, my first experience of the Shahada. That, uh, that was witnessing God, the oneness of God, the absoluteness of God directly. And the question thereafter is, how do I precipitate such an experience? Now, there are people like Timothy Leary believe that LSD is the answer to that. Uh, and that is the reason why in some cultures, peyote and some things are considered as a way of, of precipitating such experiences. But in our spiritual traditions, whether it's Christianity, Judaism, the Kabbalah, Islam and Sufism, and in many of the uh, many of the, the Gnostic, as you call it, uh, traditions within the exoteric faith traditions, lies the approach or the technology that each faith tradition provided its adherents in order to access this experience. But to me, the most important thing about spiritual experience is that when you when you experience God that way. You, you begin to practice your faith tradition from the inside out, as I call it. It's anchored on a, on, on a, real, on a real powerful foundation. Because religious practice 
practiced without that experience is not grounded adequately. And when tested by the vicissitudes of life, we are likely to have our religious faith shaken, in some cases broken or destroyed. But the other benefit of experiencing God is that when you experience God directly, it changes your attitude towards people. It changes your attitude towards the world. You begin, you, you, you di intuitively know the unity of mankind. And you, it, you, you begin to manifest the, the, the authenticity of faith and, and tradition. The, ten, the, 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 the major commandments of love the Lord thy Lord with all of your heart and your might and your strength. I'm putting in the wrong order. All of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I'm conflating two, two statements in, in the, in the um, New Testament and a couple of Deuteronomy and Leviticus in the Old Testament. It becomes, na becomes natural to you. It becomes a matter of... And, and, and when, you, when you taste the reality of God, you intuitively know... That, that your purpose in life is, is, to, is to, to be a channel in this world for all the good things and dire the directives that come from that source. And that is what propelled me. That is what, I mean, you feel a love for, every, for everything in creation. You feel a love for the animals, a care for the animals, for the environment, and you care for every human being for the varieties of human beings. And then you want to know them in the, in the, full, in, in the real, the richest sense of, of the divine command to get to know each other and to celebrate the diversity and at the same time to um, recognize the unity which underlies this diversity. Which is why I love the, uh, the, the motto on our currency a pluribus unum. Within our diversity, we are a unity. Because that, that motto uh, captures the very essence of what I've been trying to say so far. So I hope this is, suffices as, as an introduction. Thank you so much. God bless you all, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. So they're going to be collecting some questions, but um, I'll get started in, in context to what you just shared with us. And the reason I believe people came here tonight was the issue question, Islam in America. What are the challenges? What are the issues when you speak in the manner that you did? So please give us a little uh, introduction to what over the years uh, you've learned in terms of being here in the U.S., the challenges that face U.S. Islam, and what what is the progress being made, and what are some of the issues that? Can you? Who's, who's responsible for this thing? Okay. When I first came to America in 1965. Malcolm X had just been assassinated two months earlier. Um, in the perception of most Americans at that time, Islam was not associated with us Muslim, the traditional Muslim world. Was associated with, you know, my wife always says I have some kind of an energy which interferes with electronics. <laughs> um, Islam was associated with Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X. Uh, uh, you know, Muhammad Ali uh, and, and the so-called black movement. I'm breaking apart here. Uh, the, black, the black Muslim uh, movement in this country. Uh, and and, and um, so Muslims were associated with 
Hello? Um, so Islam was associated in this country. Are they trying to fix it? Or are they trying to fix both? So much I think I have, I have a duplication of uh, this. Is this any better? Okay, hopefully it'll, they, these guys can. And we should leave this thing off. That's off, and this is on. Hopefully, um, so Islam was associated at that time mainly with you know uh, Malcolm X, Louis Farrakhan, and the Black Muslim movement, and it was that was the fear that that the majority of white America had. It was not associated with Islam of much of the Muslim world. That was the the so-called black Muslim movement. And um, uh, now that's become a memory because the, uh, after Elijah Muhammad's death, uh, his successor, his son, uh, really uh, uh, gradually weaned the African-American Muslim community to what you might call the orthodoxy, the majority orthodoxy of the Islamic faith. Um, Islam in America uh, has an old history. Uh, because about 10 to 15 percent of the slaves who were brought to America were Muslim. Uh, and that's been documented. Um, but the, the beginning of Islam as a continuous tradition, of course they were, their religion was basically erased out of them, so they didn't have the continuity of that faith and its practice. Uh, but it really began, I would say, about a century ago with uh, those who emigrated from Syria, from what is Lebanon. Uh, there was no Lebanon at the time, was all basically Syria, and part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, they were fleeing from the draft. The Ottomans were, you know, trying to get young men to, to be soldiers, so many fled, and many of them uh, pretty much uh, uh, resided in, in the Michigan area because that was the, <coughs> that was the Silicon Valley of a century ago when Henry Ford was developing the, the motor car, and many of them worked in Detroit. That's why Detroit has one of the largest concentrations of Muslims in America. Uh, some of the oldest uh, people, the oldest uh, mosques were in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, so that is where the, the first Muslims who have continued and, and grown and assimilated themselves into American society. Uh, the, the big waves of immigration happened after the immigration uh, act in 1965, I believe, or 67, but after which time, then a lot of immigrants began to come from all over the world, including from various parts of the Muslim world, and that's when the um, the um, uh, immigration of larger numbers of Muslims came to this country. Uh, and as um, when I first came in 1965, there were like two mosques in all of New York City and and its metropolitan area with the third being the Elijah Muhammad's mosque, which we didn't even consider to be a mosque. Today, in New York City itself, the five boroughs, we have over 125 or 150 uh, mosques, not all of which are architecturally mosques. Many of them are just rooms or halls or storefronts, which are used for prayer purposes and for meetings. And what has happened is that um, as the immigrants from one particular culture reach critical mass, they purchase their own center. So you will have a, a mosque which is run by Bangladeshis, most of all Bangladeshis. Another one by Pakistanis, Indo-Pakistanis. Another one by Jordanian Palestinians uh, near my house. Um, uh, Turks, Albanians. We've, in New York City, you'll find many of these things which, uh, which, which occur. Um, and of course, you know, Iranians have Shia mosques, and even Arabs have Shia mosques in, 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 uh, in Michigan. So you, we, we've seen the, the, uh, the crystallization of, of cultural centers combined with, uh, with Islamic centers, in, uh, certainly in the larger metropolitan cities. And I thought this was a peculiarity, the balkanization of the Muslim community, until my, my, my rabbi friend, uh, Lenny Schoolman, told me, oh, Faisal, we were like this, you know, 70 years ago. He said, you know, that we had, uh, we had, you know, Polish syn synagogues, German synagogues, and if a 
Polish guy wanted to marry a German Jewish girl. It was worse than an interfaith marriage. And I said, that's exactly what's happening in our societies. And the same thing with my Catholic friends. Says, oh yeah, we had Polish, Polish uh, Catholic churches, Irish Catholic churches, Italian Catholic churches, and the same phenomenon. I uh, just today at lunch, we were, somebody was telling us, was it Lee, or was telling us about um, about the difference between Norwegian Lutheran churches and Swedish Lutheran churches and German Lutheran churches, and and the animosities which were called the refusal to pray in another mosque by some of their ancestors. So then I discovered that what is, we're going through today is actually the story of, of immigration of faith communities when they immigrate from one society to another. And, and just as what has happened both to the American faith communities but also in our own histories as Islam spread to various parts of the world and acculturated itself in each of those countries in terms of its cultural forms, its laws, its music, its architecture, so much that we'll, we speak today about, you know, Safavid architecture in Iran, and Ottoman architecture in Turkey, and Fatimid architecture in Egypt, and Mughal architecture, the Taj Mahal in India. These are all expressions of Islam in each of those cultures. It happened in law, it happened in schools of law, etc. So we have to do the same thing too. Part of the work that I have been talking about is we need to formulate a, an American Islamic law that is suitable and appropriate for us as Americans. Uh, an American Islamic architecture, an American Islamic culture uh, which is suitable for our descendants because our children, I mean I have a friend of mine who ten years ago, um, he has he has a son. He's from Gujarat in India. His son wears Brook Brothers suits, finely tailored suits, and works as an investment banker. He said, "When I go to my father's mosque in Flushing, Queens, it looks like it was airlifted from Gujarat and transplanted into Queens." He said, "He can't relate to the way they talk, the way they make decisions. It's, or it looks like it's all old world, and for him, that's not his world, and he can't relate to it." So he wants an expression of Islam, which is what I call a, a Brooks Brothers, you know. Well, so I prefer an Armani or a Brioni version of Islam. Of course, my Italian friends like, like that idea when I say Brioni or Armani more than a Brooks Brothers. But basically the point, you, you're, getting, you're getting the picture. And as we develop an American cultural Islam, I believe it is what our, our descendants need but it's also what will make us increasingly accepted as part of the American fabric. Got uh, several questions. I want to just kind of follow up with that. Europe has not only immigrants coming from Syria and various other countries, but for decades have had, particularly North Africa, Middle East immigrants coming into Europe, and they've had particular problems that are rather unique to Europe. What are they doing that you can see differences between how the U.S. has been able to assimilate different cultures, different groups of people that we do right here, that works for us, that Europe can learn from. And what would be some of the things that you would say to our audience in terms of how do we help these immigrants assimilate so that some of the differences, concerns, and fears that we have are not so pervasive? Uh, my previous answer is, is, in, is, is a part of the introduction to the answer to this question on what do you do with immigrants as they come to this country. They will develop their own centers, like Somalis in Minnesota, for example, have a very distinctive Somali culture, uh, which is not identical, and Turks will not feel comfortable in the Somalian environment, uh, vice versa. Uh, so we need to develop what I call an American uh, cultural Islam for the, our descendants. Um, the, 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 the advantage that we have in America is two things. One thing is that the majority of, Amer of Muslims who have immigrated to this country have tended to be more educated than the Muslims who have immigrated to Europe. But the bigger problem, in, in, in my opinion, is that Europe is tr has traditionally been what I call a monocultural society. America is traditionally a multicultural society. America prides itself on having taken immigrants and assimilated them into its, into, its, into its fabric. So, and most of us are all multi, 
I mean, you were telling me that you were, when, when he first told me his name was Seidenschwartz, I said, that's a nice German name. He said, yeah, but I have a Kelly, I have, a, I have an Irish blood, I have this German blood, I have a, Sc a Scottish, or I don't know. No German, no Scots, just a little Russian Jew and some Irish. Okay, and some, and some Jew. <laughs> there you are. So, look, I mean, and I've seen it myself. I have uh, people in my congregation, a lovely, attractive girl who is Bangladeshi, whose husband is Greek-Irish. They have three beautiful kids. And, 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 and when she was in Singapore at a very high school there, very like, you know, very exclusive school there, a beautiful blue-eyed blonde kid, when asked by the teacher, where, you know, where your national origin is, I'm Bangladeshi, she, she freaked out and, 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 and had to call her mother and say, you, you want, you're going to teach your child, you know, what national origin means. <laughs> So, so this is the reality which is happening today. We, we, even within our faith community, we have Afghans marrying Turks, we have Albanians marrying Egyptians, and, and we are seeing within our, even within our uh, intra-Islamically, the, the, the inter, increasing intermarriage between Muslims, and on Muslims and non-Muslims, so we, we are dealing with the same phenomenon which has happened to America, Americans. The European society is far more insular I mean, to be English until 50 years ago meant to be white, Anglo-Saxon, and Anglican. If you're white, Anglo-Saxon, and Catholic, that you could have, yeah, I mean, you were like the Mary Queen of Scots having, you know, having your head cut off. I mean, it was literally, it was, it was hazardous to your life. I mean, and in France, even till recently, as many of you know, People like Dominique de Valpin, who was the previous Prime Minister of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of France, was the creme de la creme of the French. I mean, you could, he would not consider himself to be equal status to the French from Marseille or Toulouse, who are considered like, you know, lesser French. And, and therefore, European society had a, has a much dif greater difficulty in assimilating people into society. This is inspired the French Revolution, by the way. In fact, the French Revolution tried to eliminate the noble classes. They still have a very distinctive class system in France, whereas in Europe, where they maintained the House of Lords and House of Commons, have been much more successful in creating a more egalitarian society uh, in, 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 in England. But that's the challenge that, 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 that Europe has had, is how do they evolve from what I call a monocultural social paradigm to the multicultural social paradigm which is the which is the, the basic social paradigm of the United States of Canada of Australia so you'll find an easier time assimilating in these uh, paradigmatically multicultural societies than you would in a mono in a monocultural paradigm society and that's why Muslims have had much easier time assimilating here than in, in Europe, and will continue to do so for a while to come. Thank you very much. We've got a lot of questions, so I'll get to some of these right now. Let's get right to the meat and potatoes here. What is your opinion of care and then demanding that Ben Carson leave the presidency race? You want me to repeat that? Yeah. <laughs> what is your opinion of care, C-A-R-E, and then demanding that Ben Carson leave no. C A I R. It's a. It's a. It's an entity that is. Uh, it's. It's a Muslim equivalent of. Uh, of. Uh, of the. Um, uh, thing that Abe Foxman uh, leads. Uh, the Anti defamation. The ADL. It's the. It's an entity that tries to uh, lobby for. Um, uh, for. For rights. Civil rights for. For Muslims in this country. Um, look. I. I. Um, The, the, the real question is, 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 you know, I mean, when Ben Carson made that remark, I, I wanted to know the neurological basis for his making that statement. <laughs> <laughs> and and until, he, until he offers me a neurological explanation, I, I, I will not take his comment uh, at, at, as being a legitimate expression of his authentic opinion. <laughs> Ben Carson, 
is, is, not, is not a Jew. He's a Christian. You know, you know who Ben Carson is. I'm, Okay. Many people are warning us the problems of the Trojan horse effect of Islamic immigration. Why are so many Islamic immigrants leaving the protection of their Sharia law run countries and coming to democratic republics in Europe and the United States? Okay, the, qu the question has embed is flawed in so many ways. That's what part of the problem with many questions. When the questions are flawed, you will not arrive at any right answers. Here's, here's the thing. People all over the world want what we have in America. People came to America for, for two major reasons, or three major reasons. They wanted, they wanted religious freedom. They wanted economic well-being. Um, primarily. They wanted to get away from regimes which did not give them uh, you know, the freedom to practice their, their beliefs did not give them uh, jobs that were adequate to, to, to being able to live a decent life. Um, and, and, and in many cases, uh, treating them in a very horrible way. This is why we flee our countries. Syrians are fleeing because they, they, they don't feel safe. They can't live properly. Um, any, any people from any country who, who can better themselves by coming here will do so. That's why people want to go to Germany, they want to go to Sweden, they want to go to the United States because you know, they can be, live a better life. It's not really, I mean, and you know, there's this misnomer about Sharia law. And as Sharia people think, you know, when, when, when Americans think of Sharia, they think of the penal code, the Talmudic penal code, which is stoning for adultery, chopping the hand for, you know, for theft, that kind of a thing. Now, surprisingly, I have asked audiences at the time of just after the Enron debacle, I asked American audiences, how many of you here would, uh, oh, we have our French professors over there, so... Um, I asked audiences, American audiences, how many people would, would, wouldn't mind chopping the hands of the Enron people responsible for that thing? You'd be surprised how many hands got up. <laughs> Maybe you wouldn't be, but I mean, so, so there, there would be a, um, you know, I'm not saying there would be an interest in implementing the Sharia Penal Code, but, but Americans think primarily of the Penal Code when they think of, of Sharia. Really, Sharia is about the Ten Commandments which we all share with the Abrahamic faith traditions. Uh, and, and for us, it's our law. So when, when the Jews have, you know, kosher, kosher food, that's part of the law. That's part of our law. I'm licensed to conduct weddings by the state city of New York, according to Sharia law. <laughs> so, I've, you know, we, we, we bury our dead in accordance to our law. So the many aspects of our law are already applied. We, 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 there's no contradiction between American law and Sharia law in almost everything, with the singular exception of the penal code. But Muslims are not in keen on applying the penal code. I mean, of, of the 57 majority Muslim countries, the only countries which apply the penal code are maybe three. So the issue of the of of of, of to, to, to think of Sharia as being the penal code is, is not what it's all about. And, and to apply our religious law, because we share with Judaism the fact that our faith is a religion of law. And law is important because law is, 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 law is how we can solve the problems actually between us. Because uh, the, the, the notion of the rule of law is a very powerful um, phrase in, in, in Western society. For religious people, the rule of religious law is a very powerful tool. So if, if, if Muslims were to say, okay, let us apply our law and how we treat Jews and Christians. And if Jews were to say, okay, Israel, you apply Jewish law 
as described by Hillel when asked to describe the, the, the Torah standing on one leg, which means in a sound bite, that's, you know, said, whatever you don't like people do to you, don't do to others. Whatever is hateful to you, don't do to others. All the rest is commentary. Go and apply this. Of course, the explanation is go and learn, which means go and go assimilate this into your behavior. If, if, this, if, if this is our law, the major commandments to love God and love our fellow human beings were the, were the rule that we apply to each other, then we would, we would be fine. And that's the core of the Sharia, by the way. So we need to, 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 to recalibrate and not think of the penal code. Penal code we are willing to leave aside. But the rest of the commandments of how to live is not something that is contradictory with American law. Next question. What do you attribute the appeal of young Westerners who are attracted to extremists versus ISIS? I, I believe that the answer to that question, I don't know what it is exactly, uh, I, but I believe the answer will be the same answer as to what attracts young kids to, to Nazi ideas, um, I just was told by a friend of mine that there was a kid in her neighborhood in New Jersey whom they discovered, uh, the police went and discovered like weapons and arms and bullets and ammunition and the guy did something, had an argument and committed, shot himself, committed suicide or something like that. Uh, we have, look, with, with an America with, with 300 million people, we have our share of crazies. Kids who kill high school kids in Columbine. I mean, what do you attribute that to? Well, we have 1.5 billion people. Some people say 1.6, 1.7, who knows. But with 1.5 billion people, we too have our share of crazies. And given the, given the, um, the, the in many cases, the, uh, the very difficult conditions under which they live, be it in Palestine, be it in Egypt, be it in whatever, uh, it isn't surprising that, you know, 30,000, which is a fragment of a percent, uh, would be, would, 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 could be easily drawn into, into, uh, into this kind of a thing. I believe it's, uh, uh, it's young people who feel perhaps a sense of, um, uh, of non-belonging, uh, who, who, you know, and, and, uh, uh, feel the desire to to act out those things, but it's it's the same category of people who who are attracted to violence, and and altruistic violence, as Jonathan Sachs calls it. I mean, why why would a kid take a take a rifle, go to this, go to this, you know, to a part of the university and just shoot his fellow college students? I once, and you know, I have many audiences like this, I've often, very often taken a, and maybe we'll do it today. How many of you at some point on your life considered suicide? Just three, four hands. Well, usually, actually, it's about more like 20%. When, I, when, I, when we get comfortable with each other and people feel comfortable, you know, revealing. Now, at any moment in time, there are a few people who have had difficult moments in life, feel really depressed, and then moments of vulnerability. You know, if somebody told you, listen, uh, I'll give you $100,000 to commit suicide and, you know, whatever, there will, be, there will be a certain number who will be drawn to that. And that's how Saddam Hussein, you know, uh, at one time uh, paid people in, uh, in, in, in Palestine to commit suicide. So, so you will always have people who are vulnerable, and if you target them, you can cull them from the from the population, and uh, and and uh, give them an ideology that uh, they will uh, endorse, and give them a sense of belonging and a sense of power and empowerment, and let them do terrible things. So here's a good question, kind of as along those lines: Is Islam undergoing substantial transformation, a reformation? Now, how would you characterize it? The ref Islam doesn't need a reformation. 
in the same sense that Christianity. You, we're again applying something within the history of, of, of the, Christ, the Christian populations which does not really apply well, doesn't translate well to, to, the, to the Islamic context. Islam as a religion does not need any reformation. And the issues which, are, which the Muslim world is dealing with right now really has nothing to do with religion. As I mentioned on the radio show, all conflicts are based upon two parties fighting for an asset. Can be two individuals, two tribes, two, and, and what differentiates this group from the other can be anything. And the asset can be anything, but it's something that they both want, and they're fighting over. So it can be two guys fighting for the love of a woman. It can be two groups of people fighting for a shared land, which explains, explains the origin of the problem with the native Indians and the white man who came here. The same thing with what happened in Palestine. It's about land. Um, it's ma mainly, most of the time, most conflicts are about power and, and economic parity, or jobs, or opportunity. So the conflict in Ireland, for example, between Catholics and Protestants, have nothing to do with Catholic ideology or beliefs. It's the fact that the Irish Catholics felt that they did not have parity with the Irish Protestants in terms of the power pie and the economic pie. So you can differentiate people by anything. You can, I can create a gender war by not giving women jobs, not giving them equal power. By, by saying women are inferior to men, that men are from Mars and women are from Venus, and that explains, and you can create a whole new ideology based upon, and, and people will be, be convinced. In fact, in spite of the fact that many, many women I know are brighter than many men I know, you can create gender, you can create conflict based upon skin coloring, is what happened in America and create conflict based upon any differentiating set. If I were to all of a sudden in this society today say only blue-eyed people will get jobs and, and any other colored-eyed people will be denied, you will have a conflict based upon color of the eyes. And then within a generation or two we'll create a whole theology as to why blue-eyed people are superior and smarter and deserved blah 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 blah. So we have to look at the real cause of the problem. And even when religious wars happened, it's because of the belief was the asset. So it, most people really don't care what you believe in, as long as the belief does not manifest in issues of power or, or, you know. I mean, even within a university department, if you don't believe in theory of evolution, for example, if you're a creationist in a, in a, in a and in the Eastern University on, on biology, you will not get a tenure. Um, so, so we have to understand the source of the conflict. But what happened is most of the time today is that people look for the conflict in something else and say, ah, that's the reason. That's usually not the reason. If you look at the conflict, let's say, in, in, in the Middle East today, it, it, there's a, yes, there's a storyline. There's a continuous story which has gone on for the last century. And there are many strands to it, but primarily it's about those issues. People who have been denied the rights for political expression, the right to become, uh, you know, empowered, and and the right to have a, a, a to be able to make a good living. In, in my mind, I was, uh, you're talking about the Middle East, but there is an historic and current issue in terms of. Help the audience understand the differences between the Sunni and the Shia, because that's a conflict right now that when you consider Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, and, and Syria, these are things that we can't ignore, and there are distinct differences and issues that continue to fester between those two groups. Yes. If you look at the relationship between Sunnis and Shias in Iraq, up until the Iraq war, the Sunnis and Shias, well, there was intermarriage between them between Sunnis and Shias in Iraq, in Syria, in Egypt, in many, many, in Pakistan, many countries, 
Now what has happened is that um, in Iraq, Saddam Hussein was a Sunni, and his Sunni minority oppressed the, 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 uh, the Shia majority. So after the Iraq war and democracy, and the, so we've had what some of our founding fathers call a tyranny of the majority, which is what they warned against. So now the Shia are majority, the Sunnis became, felt marginalized from the power and economic pie. And what we see now and label today as ISIS is really the movement of Sunnis in, in Iraq and Syria for parity with the Shias. But because they very cleverly wrapped themselves in the mantle of Islam, called themselves the Islamic State, and they were supported by countries like Saudi Arabia, because what has happened is that Iraq, Bahrain, Yemen, Syria have become proxies for the, for the battle between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Saudi Arabia regarding itself as the champion of Sunni Islam, and Iran is championing the Shia Muslim community. But the source of this always goes to issues of power. So it has nothing to do with, uh, with, 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 with ideology, it's just that, oh, the, in Bahrain, the, 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 the Sunni minority has power over a, over a majority Shia population. The Shia population want, want, wants parity in the power and economic pie, and they're supported by by Iran. And, and so Bahrain's leadership in trying to put down the uh, uprisings calls upon Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and you have that area became a proxy, but unfortunately unfortun it didn't blow out to the extent uh, of what has happened in Yemen. In Yemen, in, in, in Syria, and in Iraq, you have a much worse situation. Uh, where you're creating, actually, dis we're destroying states. States are being destroyed. Historical sites are being destroyed. The social structures which keep a society vibrant are being broken apart. And uh, I'm, I'm afraid for the, for the future in these countries. I believe also the question I was asking, too, to give an historic perspective of what actually was that schism that happened between Sunni and Shia to identify the differences between those two. The schism originally originated after the death of a prophet when uh, there was a dispute, especially at the time of the uh, election of the, um, of, the, of the successor to the prophet, whether the successor, because, because the prophet Muhammad shares with David and Solomon the fact that he became a, a king, a ruler. He had political power in addition to being a prophet. So, and he died as he died as with, with having this power. So after he died, it was clear there would be no more prophet. But the question is, who would succeed the prophet in political power? The question was, should it be a descendant of the prophet? Or should it be, could it be anybody? And in particular, should it be descendant from the line of Ali, his cousin and son-in-law, who married his daughter? Or could it be anybody else? So was this dispute which gave birth the difference between the Sunni and the Shia. And it became a conflict after Imam Ali's death. Those who felt his son, Hussein, Hassan first, and who abdicated then Hussein. And Hussein then made a uh, stand against the Muawiyah, who was an unpopular ruler. But he prevailed militarily over Imam Ali, uh, his son, and actually uh, uh, killed his uh, son, Hussein. And, uh, there, and this was a major trauma to the whole Muslim community. But uh, because of political power, the uh, Muawiyah and his son Yazid basically developed the, the Sunni theology, uh, which is that anybody could become a ruler. That was the origin of the schism. It resulted in some minor interpretations of law and jurisprudence. But the, par the poignancy of it all is that even today in Iran, now that you have a Shia uh, 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 society which has established political rule, even they themselves have come to the conclusion that, that some of their presidents are not necessarily from the bloodline of the prophet. So it goes to show that, as, as that real, the reality of, of, of politics eventually dominates. Uh, but the differentiation became a differentiation. 
And fortunately, that differentiation became a, uh, a way of, of uh, became one of the, the, the ways by which a group of people was not given parity uh, on this particular issue. And like I said, you can create on any basis, and sectarian difference was one of the differences, just as happened in Ireland between, between Catholics and Protestants. Thank you. Next question. Why are modern Muslims in the U.S. and around the world been more vocal in criticizing radical Muslims? We have been extremely vocal. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that it's not considered newsworthy. Um, I mean, we've, I've been engaged in major, major interfaith activities. It's considered not newsworthy. Uh, I was at a, um, a conference on Islamophobia a couple of weeks ago in Philadelphia with a number of evangelical Christians. And some of them said, you know, we heard of this guy, and some of them, my friends of mine, they said in 2010 there was this evangelical who we never heard of, who has only like 25, 30 people in his audience. Wants to, was, wants to burn the Quran. It became a headline news item. And it became a headline item in the Muslim world. And Muslims felt, oh, Americans are burning the Quran. That was the, that was the headliner. And most Americans haven't heard of him, didn't pay him any attention, don't think he is of any importance. But what has happened is that the news media highlighted it. It was expanded and highlighted in the, in, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the Muslim world and resulted in people rioting and people getting killed in the Muslim world in some countries like Pakistan. So this is what the media does. The media has this capacity to, to, um, to uh, it, deems, it deems those things as newsworthy and the, 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 major, the, the, the moral majority, if I can use that word, of, of, of Americans, of Muslims, are not deemed newsworthy. And unfortunately, that actually, that can result in aggravating these problems and in, in growing conflicts. So the media has a, um, um, has a culpable role in, uh, in the expansion of, of conflict in this day and age, which has become much, much vastly more overtaken by the internet and the uh, and, and the cyber news media. So in, in, in talking to our audience, uh, based on what you said, then where should we seek out information? What, what sources are available if you want to become better educated, if you want to hear divergent views, if you want to develop more critical thinking in terms of this very complicated issue, what would you suggest to us? Montana World, Coun World, World Council. Okay. <laughs> I'll get your state field <laughs> And many, many places like this, you know, I mean, um, um, we have to make the challenge we have today. I mean, look, I have more in common with, with people like, like Laurie, people like you, who are Jews, who are Christians, who are atheists. What we call, probably I like the word moderates, but we don't have a better word. But, but moderates, really, there are only two religions in the world. Moderates and extremists. Okay? And moderates are going to go to heaven, extremists are going to go to hell, as far as I'm concerned. There's only there's two, 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 you know, eschatological, uh, you know, end points. Um, it, it's either you live in a way that is, that, that is, that is humane, that that is godly, or you, you live in a way that's ungodly. And, um, um, you know, that's where the battlefront is, between the, between the moderates of all faith traditions against the extremists of all faith traditions. We have to find a way to get all the extremists and put them together somewhere. <laughs> and make them realize that they have the same mentality, whether they are they're Jews, Muslims, Christians, atheists, I mean, you know, the, 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 the atheist communists who really created the gulag and created all this terrible stuff in, in the ex-Soviet republics, the same mentality of the Muslim extremists today, of any extremist of any, of any faith tradition. That is our common enemy. We have to identify them all as our common enemy. 
and make sure we get rid of extremism in all its forms, beginning with us, because you don't often see it when we do it. So uh, along those lines, what are some of the things that, that in the past criticisms, past and present of the West is, we promote certain values, but we don't adhere to those values. So we promote democracy, freedom, expression, and yet we support regimes in the Middle East that are antithetical to this. How does that get viewed by societies in the Middle East and culture in terms that is why many Muslims, and many people in various parts of the Muslim world have hostile feelings towards America. Because they feel America supported regimes which they didn't want. They supported regimes which oppressed its people. Uh, that's why, I mean, and, and, and people in the Muslim world are pretty savvy. They know, they say, We're not, we have nothing against Americans. But your policies are hurting us. You know, just, we just want you to just improve your policies. You talk about human rights, but you don't want human rights for us. Uh, you're supporting this Shah who is oppressing us. You're p supporting this, you know, Mubarak regime that is denying us our rights and not giving us, and, 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 and usurping the wealth of the country. Um, you know, uh, this, is, this, is the, this is the issue. Most people just want a decent living. Most people are willing to give up political power if you give them a well-paying job so they can love their sweet, marry their sweethearts, have a family, feed their children, and educate them, and clothe them, and live, you know, what we call life, liberty, pursuit of happiness issues. This is what most people all over the world want. And they're willing to abide, even if you have an, I mean, even in countries like, let's say, the Emirates or Singapore, which is really, not really very free in terms of, you don't, you don't have democracy, but, you have, you know, economic successes. You don't see people, you know, Emiratis trying to immigrate out of the Emirates. You don't see Singaporeans trying to immigrate to outside countries <coughs> because they live well and they eat very well. We have time for just a couple more questions and uh, some wonderful questions here, folks. I wish we can get to all of them. Is it possible that the current tension in the West over Islam is due more to divergent views on individuality, identity, permissiveness between Western liberal society and Middle Eastern tribal community, communal social structure than it does with religion? Yes, but at its core, most, most conflicts are about, what I said, power and, and economic opportunity. If you, if, look, I mean, Women in America don't go topless in the beach. French women do. But you don't see a hostility towards France. Okay. So I, I, I believe that the issue of, of values uh, and, and how you want to live has to, is not, does not become so much of an issue. It becomes an issue in some societies where they say, you know what, do this in the privacy b b of your walls, but don't do it in public. See, our cultures, uh, you know, m most of the Asian cultures even, not only Muslim cultures, but these are actually pre-Islamic uh, uh, values. We don't exhibit our emotions in public the way Westerners do. Okay, you will not see men and women, you know, making out in the streets of Cairo like they do in the streets of Paris. Or, 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 or certain European societies. So when Europeans come to our societies, like in, 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 in the Emirates, and, and they do those things on the beach, and then they get pulled in and hauled in because it offends the sensitivities of these, of these, of these people. It's like uh, somebody walking topless in this room right now. We probably have, you could probably call the police to come and, you know, take them for indecent exposure. Um, it's that kind of a thing. But that's not, that's not really, that's not the, that's peripheral. That's not central to the issues. Uh, if you want to do this, I mean, you do this in the privacy of your home. That's not a problem. So the incidents that you hear about where people say, oh, they're imposing all their values on us. Let me tell you something. You go to Saudi Arabia, where every woman is dressed in this veil, right? They go out dressed in the veil. You go to their parties and you see what happens when they take out their veils. You'll see them in the most latest fashions from Paris, from Milan, 
with provocative, you know, decol what do you call it, decolletage, you know, I mean, you will find, I mean, behind closed doors in Saudi Arabia, in, the, in these conservative societies, uh, values which say, where do these values come from? They are very Western values. So I don't buy the fact that the, 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 the value system is, is the core of the problem. Uh, well, last question. The Middle East is overwhelmingly youthful in terms of its population. Saudi Arabia, Iran, the population under 30 is almost two-thirds or uh, three-quarters of the population. So if you're advising our leaders, in terms of how to effectively, long-term, make positive change, knowing that you've got this very young, technologically savvy population in this region, what would you say to them? You've got, you've got to deal with, with, with their aspirations, no doubt. I mean, everybody in the world today wants, you know, the i6 plus, or the latest fashion of whatever it might be. Um, in terms of in terms of technology, in terms of this, in terms of that, and 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 the fact of the matter is that because everybody in the world now has an iPhone or a Samsung Galaxy or whatever it is, they are all connected to each other. I remember reading a very fascinating fascinating book and about Iraqis and people in in, in Iraq and who take these these phones were able to generate ways by which they could c call each other for free before you had free calling. Uh, kids are extremely creative uh, and, and, and they're connected. And, and by virtue of being on the internet, they know what's going on in the rest of the world. So you can't fool a population anymore. Uh, in fact, I remember reading many years ago that what really broke down British society was when television and, and magazines took the, the common people into the homes of the super wealthy people and I mean, I mean, there's a program I remember back in the 60s, The Lives of the Rich and Famous or something like that, where you'd see how they lived. And people says, oh, my goodness. That helped break down the, the, uh, the barriers of, of, of class. And today the Internet has, has broken down even the barriers of, 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 of national boundaries. People today know what peop other people do. They communicate with people all over the world. And, and, and they want what everybody else has. So we have to figure out a way to, uh, to, to give them what, what they need. And at the bottom of it all, I would say, is the thing that you focus on, economics. And, and how do we generate a, a future that all of these people can participate in and, and feel you know, that they are party to it? That's the answer. We, you know, the, we need 21st century problems, uh, solutions. And many of the problems that we that we lived with are, are almost to me passe. We were talking today about how to solve the Israeli Palestinian issue. People people less and less identify with geography. And and uh, people basically want what everybody and if you give people what, what, what everybody else has, they don't care what you call them. Call me in Palestinian, call me an Israeli, call me an American. And, what I, and people who are fleeing from, from Syria today and they come here, I mean, they will be anxious to get that green card and get that U.S. passport. Okay, I'm an American today. I myself am considered an American. What does it mean? The important thing is that your deepest values are there. You're able to practice your faith. You're able to eat the food you want. And in America, we can do that. But not in every way we can do that. You know, I mean, you can eat hummus whether you're... Jewish or, or, or Arab or Palestinian or Muslim or Christian or atheist, as long as we can enjoy those foods and, and, and you know, buy the clothes we want and have a, become economically you know, empowered, people don't, don't mind what you call them. If I make all of you millionaires tomorrow, who those who aren't millionaires already, if I offer you the opportunity to become billionaires, if you call ourselves Russians, we'll all call ourselves Russians. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> all right, just a, a few couple of closing remarks. Uh, Iman Pfeiffer will be in the lobby signing uh, his book, Moving the Mountain. So those of you who would like to have a few moments to chat with him will be outside in the lobby. 
And also a reminder, the cards that you have, if you do want information on updates in terms of programs and upcoming events, please fill those out and leave them uh, up to uh, one of our assistants. And finally, in closing, this discussion does not happen without you here tonight. So I thank you from the heart for every one of you who took the time to come out here and spend this time with our very special guest. Thank you. Can I make a plug on my, I have a book coming out in a week from today, actually. I forgot to make a plug for my book, so my, my... Well, and so would you. And it, it relates to the very subject we're talking about. It's a book, actually, called Defining Islamic Statehood. And, and this book I, uh, describes the, the project that I did where I convened a dozen scholars from different countries on Islamic law to, uh, to, 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 to probe them. If, if there was such a thing as an Islamic State, how would you define it? Uh, and so it's a fascinating uh, book in which I um, summarize the findings of this group of scholars. And, uh, and we tried actually to, to, to measure that definition, create a methodology for measuring it. That's what took so long. And we achieved breakthrough a few years back. And this describes the story and many people think it's very important, especially in dealing with the false um, um, definition of so-called Islamic statehood that ISIS is promulgating. So hopefully this would be one of the potential antidotes at the ideological level towards ISIS, and I recommend you read it. Thank you. Thank you.